all nerds in the academe. In one way or another, we were the bullied in high school. We were the insecure ones. And so we wanted to be smart. So that was our own way of proving our worth, right? Probably the typical question of, say, someone living in the third world country. Like, how is that even possible? How can I make it big internationally? Do not disqualify yourself. Let them disqualify you, but do not ever disqualify yourself. Make sure that your joy, your greatest joy, meets the world's greatest need. And that is where you will find your life's purpose. Can we do better? Is it enough? What else is missing? What else is lacking? What else should we do? The moment you open your mouth to religion, you're gonna make an enemy of the other person. The moment you talk about politics, it's much worse, right? And then you combine these two together, world war. You may have your own peace, but the world doesn't have its peace. Is that peace? Welcome to Meaningful. Marketing, mentoring, mattering. With me, Joseph Alcantara. Together, we'll uncover the power of purpose. Experience mentorship magic. Unpack ways to make a difference. And find transformative journeys as a community. Welcome to Meaningful. Marketing, mentoring, mattering. With me, Joseph Alcantara. And this month, we're celebrating the rich cultural heritage and significant contributions of the Asian, American, and Pacific Islander community. So join us as we dive deeper into stories of innovation, resilience, and influence in the world of marketing and beyond, and how the community's involvement make a very meaningful impact. Today, we have a very special guest. His name is J.L. Cornelio. He's a professor of development studies at the Ateneo de Manila University, where he holds the Fora Research Foundation Professorial Chair. He is currently based as a visiting professor at the Center for Asian Democracy at the University of Louisville here in the U.S., and his scholarly work revolves around the areas of religious change, religion, and public life, and the sociology of generations. He authored six books and counting, and published countless journals and papers, and is currently co-running two projects funded by the British Academy. Jail finished the PhD in sociology in 2011 at the National University of Singapore as a scholar of the Asia Research Institute and was a visiting scholar at Lancaster University and a postdoctoral fellow at the Max Planck University for the study of religious and ethnic diversity in Göttingen. He has since held visiting posts at various universities globally. And in 2021, he was named among the outstanding young men of the Philippines for his contributions to education and sociology. We've also seen him as a resource person for local and international media companies such as CNN Philippines, ANC, BBC, Channel News Asia, National Public Radio, Al Jazeera, and The Atlantic, to name a few. Please welcome to the pod, J.L. Cornelio. Hi, J.L. Hello, Joseph. What an introduction. Hello, everyone. It's good to be here. It's a meaningful month to be here on your meaningful show. I'm very, very honored um, that you said yes to this. I, I do understand that we share the same kind of advocacy especially in this kind of community that we are serving no exactly it's for that reason that i said yes and also academics right we 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 normally are literally and figuratively in this ivory tower Uh, it's upon us you know the responsibility to communicate with the wider public and to be in a conversation with different kinds of people Knowledge that doesn't make a difference out there is useless if you think about it. So thank you for the invitation. So yeah, let's dive right into the details. But before we go into the very meaty part of Hmm. this topic, I'd want to go back first to your meaningful life story. 
your background, to your origin story, to your lived experience. Take us back. Give us a snapshot of what Jay Yeel has done before that led him to what he is doing today. Okay, let's try to uh, give you a bite-sized uh, narrative, you know, of my of my life. I'm not young anymore. Uh, I've always, I've always wanted to be an academic, to be honest. Uh, this was when I was an undergraduate and I did my undergraduate in the Philippines. This was in the in Ateneo de Manila University, where I am now a professor of development studies. Uh, at the time, I was mesmerized uh, by uh, my sociology professor. There was one in particular and she's still, she's still a wonderful woman and she's now in another university and I'm just, and, and she was doing a lot of important work on uh, uh, gender and deviance. And I thought that sociology gave counterintuitive answers, questions that other people would take for granted. And in the Philippines, there are many of these things. You think about politics, family, religion, being Filipino, being Catholic, that kind of thing. Those are all just taken for granted. But the moment you enter a sociology class, you realize that there are so many ways to think about this, these, these, these issues. And there's no one big answer. Uh, there are so many answers about being Filipino, for example, or about being Catholic or about being Christian or about being religious. And we can go on and on. I found that meaningful for me early on, when I, even when I was in first year or second year in the, uh, as an undergraduate student, I knew that I wanted to be an academic and make a difference. Also, I mean, this is a little shallow. I really thought that the doctor title was cute. Okay, maybe I okay, maybe I should have that title too. And then and then another teacher, another professor told me later on, Jail, you have to finish your PhD by 30. And I without realizing it, that was in the back of my mind. So and I and and I did. And I finished my PhD one day before I turned 29. This was a long time ago. So, so it's one of those those accomplishments. But you know, that's just one way of uh, looking at how I have charted the territory, my life territory, if you will. But on the other hand, uh, Joseph, the the honest, uh, the reality is that I have always wanted to be uh, to pursue something meaningful. Even when I was about to finish my undergraduate, so this was in two thousand three, I had opportunities to work in certain sectors that were far more lucrative, more exciting, if you think about it. Um, but then I decided to become a teacher. That was my first job. And then I, later on, I became a development worker. I tried the private sector, but we actually realized that, okay, that wasn't really for me. And then I became a development sector in an island in the northern Philippines. And then I became an academic. Each decision I made was always about um, pursuing not just my dreams, but also what I thought would make a difference in our society. I mean, it's it it might sound too cliche-ish if uh, for our listeners and for those who are just tuned in, but but for me, growing up in the Philippines, um, I don't think you can be selfish. You know, you're not mm. allowed to be selfish given the many issues that our country is faced with, and so this is the reason why I, I at the end of the day, after all the potential career that I have as an academic. Outside the Philippines, I decided to just go back to the Philippines as well. Oh, of course, I'm here in the U.S. right now, but this is just a blip. Um, this mm -hmm. is just a, a, mm -hmm. quick, a quick break. I'm still going. Back. I, lo mm -hmm. so, yeah. I love. I love the. I would say like roller coaster journey. Like listening to your story, that a very good professor, I would have to say, influenced you to really get into sociology, and then eventually you had those arbitrary goals written. I want to have the doctor title by thirty, and then I want to try, I want to try it out when it comes to the private sector or the for profit part of you know um, being a professional. But yes. eventually realizing the deeper sense. Yes. or the noble part of what you can potentially do um, given all the, you know, the highlights or the experiences that you've had. What were those um, trigger moments or sudden influences or those internal motivational forces that drove you to realize that, you know what, no, JL, um, it is best for you to serve in the academe, it is best for you to go back to the Philippines and serve, you know, you know, yeah. the country and the people and the generations that are next in line for you. What were those trigger moments? Wow. Okay. There's quite a number to be honest, but one that forever haunts me is an experience that I had when I was at the Max Planck Institute. This was in Germany, right? So I did my postdoc. So after my PhD, I got a two-year research fellowship, postdoctoral fellowship. 
at one of the leading institutes in the world. And this was uh, the Max Planck Institute. And I was a very privileged, blessed to be in a really good department called the Religious Diversity Department. I was working with other scholars um, interested in India, in Southeast Asia, in East Asia, so the kind of thing I was working on Singapore, in and on Singapore at the time. Uh, and one of the things that we do, one of the traditions at the Max Planck Institute was every week we would have a session together and we would talk about our papers. One time we were having a conversation about poverty somewhere in Asia. And at that time, I had a, an existential crisis. Uh, one or two reasons. One, the first one was that um, we were talking about poverty uh, somewhere outside Europe in the comfort of our institute. This doesn't have anything to say about the institute per se, right? It was my own internal dilemma, dissonance, right? Um, you can be anywhere in the world and be serving the world. Uh, I think many of us would understand that. Uh, we can make a difference everywhere we are in the world, right? But for me, something was amiss about being in a comfortable zone. Uh, I needed a printer just right next to me. There was a printer. I needed a fantastic MacBook. The Institute would give it to me and, and so on and so forth. And those were wonderful things, right? And we would talk about difficult realities outside the Institute or uh, outside Europe. So there was somehow a dissonance. You know, the reality uh, just now, I, when we when we began the conversation, I was talking about the academe being an ivory tower. There might be some truth to that, right? And academics, one way or another, have to decide, you know, wh uh, what to do about it, okay? So that's one. But at the same time, Joseph, this was in the wake of Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines. So mm. you, know, you know it in the Philippines. And this was the uh, one of the biggest super typhoons to have ever hit any country in the world uh, in recent memory. And, and it devastated a huge proportion of our population. And I felt that I was too distant physically and, and, and intellectually from the life of, my, of our society, of Philippine society. And you know, when the Lord works or the universe conspires, the, conspira the, the conspiracy the puzzle pieces do come together. Mm. At the time that I was going through all of that existential dilemma, Ateneo, my university now, reached out to me and asked if I wanted to come back to the Philippines and, be ah. and become the department head of, of development studies. The biggest, the most convincing fact, point, the question is, right? I, I, I knew that it was the universe, it was the Lord really doing this, was that my job was going to be very demanding and my salary was going down. Mm. <laughs> so all the way from, right? so I was earning already euros, right, in, in, in Germany. And, and there I was getting offered a much lower pay, one third of my pay, <laughs> for a much more difficult position in the university. Therefore, it must be God. <laughs> mm. And to me, that was it. And to me, that was it. But the rest is, you know, but... The rest is history and no regrets. Only because in the past decade or so, in the past decade or so, I've just realized that um, if I were not back in the Philippines, maybe I would be flourishing somewhere else. But I think the sensibility as a Filipino academic would be very different. If you're in the country, as you know, Joseph, if you're in the country, your 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 proximity to the issues, to the politics, to the issues that people are talking about, oh, they, they affect you more than mm. if you were outside the Philippines. Wow, that is a very beautiful and very profound piece of your story, which is really very admirable. All the more to me is like listening to it because like a lot of pieces that I want to unpack there would be, mm. yes, I am with you on, you know, certain chapters or aspects in people's lives being defined by how whether it's God or the universe or the energy that you believe in that kind of makes everything work for you based on what's the right path for you. Mm -hmm. And then second would be, you know, in your situation as an educator and being a way and making realize that, do I want to be an audience member or do I want to be a player to make that massive dif difference that's actually needed that I know that I can be a part of. And I think the third part to it is, you know, the practical reality of life we're in at this day and age, it's about commercialism. It's about being rich based on monetary terms. Like how can you swallow the big dip that you would have to sacrifice financially so that you can do such a noble, 
um, cost for your country and the people around you, that must be probably so hard to swallow. But then again, you're right. Once you're there and you know that you're in the right place, the right situation, doing what you're supposed to do based on what's, you know, what your meaningful purpose or your calling in life is, everything will just probably connect and click based on what is ideal and right for you. So I was like, wow, that is super inspiring. Well, no, absolutely, Joseph. There's one, I mean, thank you for, for unpacking all of that, not just like that. In 20, something just came uh, to my mind now. In 2015, I underwent some, uh, not clinical depression, but close enough. And close enough that I had to see a therapist. And, and one of the things that my therapist told me, and it also became a spiritual journey, asked me to do was to read a Frederick Buechner, a theologian and philosopher. And one of his most important uh, statements is that if you want to find your purpose in the world, you have to discover the joy, that which gives you joy, and the greatest need of the world. And in his, his proposition was that if you want to discover what the Lord's will for your life is, make sure that your joy, your greatest joy, meets the world's greatest need. And that is where you will find your life's purpose. And even to this day, even to this day, I, I thought that in 2015, that encapsulated the entire trajectory up to that point. But also that gave me the, uh, the sense of motivation. Oh for how I would live the rest of my life. And now that I'm in my 40s, it's also a pivotal moment for me. Um, I'm now thinking of the next, what, two decades before I retire. Um, of course, I can say this because I'm now a full professor and and there's some, you know, there's some uh, safety nets here, you know, I've got savings and so on and so forth. But just the same, you know, just the same. I, I, I don't want to squander. I don't want to waste the opportunity. I want to fulfill a meaningful, joyful life but at the same time, use that life for you know, education, um, writing about issues that matter in our society and sticking my head out sometimes, even, you know, um, talking about things that would invite criticisms from people who would be offended by what I say. <laughs> you know, sociologists mm -hmm. normally talk about the most difficult topics, you know, especially religion and politics. These are not the easiest topics to talk about in the Philippines. So it's part of the game. That's true. And that's great. I think I love how you've mentioned about this stage in your life and being honest about your age, by the way, you don't look on your, you know, mid forties or early forties, but then again, <laughs> let's just realize that it, I'm sure that it took time before you've reached this stage of realization and maturity that, okay, J.O., this is what will give you joy and meaning. So, you know, let's embrace that. Probably that's not what you were thinking of when you were in your mid twenties up, up to your thirties, right? So most of the people who are probably listening to us today, especially those folks who are, you know, in the younger spectrum in the AAPI community, whether they are here in the US or, you know, back in their home countries being inspired by this conversation, hearing and seeing your profile, I would have to say that you're like a student and teacher of the world because you've traveled to learn as well as to serve. And I've seen that you had a lot of um, grants or scholarships coming from various institutions. Probably the typical question of, say, someone from the Philippines or living in the third world country is like, how is that even possible? How can I make it big internationally? What should be the things that I, I should um, think of, I should be doing? What would be your you know, tips or suggestions or inspiring words for those people who are listening to this conversation who might probably think that you know, that is not accessible for me in my current situation? Ah, okay. That's where we should start. Um, do not disqualify yourself. Uh, my own mentor uh, in graduate school, that was the very first thing he told me. This was when I was doubting myself. And uh, this was towards my PA to the end of my PhD. And I was wondering if I would get a job anywhere, you know. And he was saying, Jail, let them disqualify you, but do not ever disqualify yourself. So I think internally, psychologically, mentally, you got to be the first person to fight for yourself. Um, the moment that you drop the the guards and the barrier, you know that emotional protection that you have for yourself. That's that's that that's the moment when all the anxieties would come crashing down on you. So do not disqualify yourself. That's psychological. That's more internal. But I think the more important one I feel is that you would want to be mentored by the right people. 
in my experience, um, what really made a difference was that I was surrounded by, by the right people. Uh, uh, and by that, I mean to say people who um, not only opened doors uh, because they were professors also, and they were wonderful advisors, thesis advisors, you know, all that, but also because they were just there to listen to my stories and to my issues. So mentors matter um, um, because at the end of the day, um, we have to acknowledge that this journey is not our personal journey alone. I do not really subscribe to that kind of philosophy. You know, that's very individualistic. At the end of the day, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes mm -hmm. a village to survive catastrophes. It takes a village to to thrive not just as a person, but as an entire community and entire race, if you think about it, you know, humanity. So individualism, you know, I, I, don't, I don't buy that. You know, it's not your own story to tell. It's your community's story to tell together. Not easy, but together. It's, it's going to make a huge difference. Mentoring, mentorship uh, matters a lot. So those who are my fellow Filipinos in the, in the country right now or those who are in the minorities, all the more all the more that we want to be surrounded by people we look up to <laughs> and people we would allow to say things to us, sometimes uh, encouraging ones, sometimes provocative ones, just to challenge us. I say all of that because, because I feel at the end of the day, we need these mentors to show us that there are other perspectives available. And in my in my experience, that, that was these mentors were very pivotal. In, you know, uh, writing references. You know, when I was applying mm. for graduate school, for example, telling me, okay, consider this university or that university, or even introducing me to the right people. At the end of the day, Joseph, the reality is that I've got all these scholarship grants, right? Of course, I had to work hard for them and to apply to write the proposals. That's how it works in the academia, right? You have to write good research proposals. You have to submit good grades and so forth. But in many other cases, it's also your social capital. It's all, that's, mm. that's a psychological term that we use to refer to your relationships, strategic relationships that you can use to chart your life, if you will. It's really the balance between, like looking at your credentials, when people see it on paper, they'll probably think that, oh my God, he is the smartest, the most intelligent Filipino that they probably have seen or read profile wise. But I love how you've blended the social capital, or I would say the mm -hmm. human skills that yes. you would have to intersperse with both your functional skill and the human skill so that you present yourself to the world that ultimately will subscribe to what your potentials can be, because it's not all about the academic. It's not all about you know, the qualifications that you can showcase to the world. But to your point, it's also those relationships. It's also, yeah. you know, um, your social agency. It's not just you yourself pushing forward when it comes to your oh. own agenda and when it comes to your own goal. So I love the combination when it yes. comes to you mentioning that. I really yeah. appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And because it takes a village and because it takes human relationships to activate these things, kindness matters. Mm. In my experience, and the academe can be full of so many insecure and nasty people. Insecurity. Really? Really? Yes, of course, of course, because the academe has a lot of insecure people. There, but we're we're all we're all nerds in the academe. In one way or another, we were the bullied in high school. We were the insecure ones in high school, and so we wanted to be smart. So that was our own way of proving our worth, right? Because we couldn't play basketball, we couldn't play volleyball, we couldn't play any of that. So the only way forward for us was to be smart, to go to the library. And this is not just my story. It's a story of many, many other insecure <laughs> academics. I can relate. I bet you can. I bet you can. And I was I bet many others can relate to that because I have encountered a lot of insecure academics. Unfortunately, if one is unable to master that insecurity, you tend to think of everybody else as your enemy. That and and you know, and and couple that with competition and meritocracy and all this all the games that we play in the academe, the reality is that the reality is that you can you can become you can become nasty or hostile towards other people. And I think that's very sad because at the end of the day, and, and believe you me, I have in, 
in my career, I have encountered people who are so nasty that the people around them are just waiting for them to retire. And that's very sad. You don't want to reach your 60 or 65 or 70. You exit the door and people are clapping, not because they are proud of you, but because they're just happy that you're going to be out, right? Well, that's that's beautiful additional advice as well. And I think that's one of the most important ones, um, you know, in everything that you've mentioned. It's all about that kindness. It's that compassion and empathy that you should apply. At the end of the day, we'll not be measured based on all the grades that we have or yeah. the amount of, you know, you know, diplomas, how long our titles probably would be, but is really, you know, how people felt when they were with us. And I think it, it all boils down to that compassion and kindness that you've mentioned. That's right. And especially for us in the minorities, right? we're all in the same boat. We sink or swim together. The last thing that we ever want is, is, um, uh, to drown other people so that we are the ones who survive. I think that's a, that's an unfortunate philosophy in life. I love that you've mentioned about us as minorities to embrace each other and be there for each other because we'll swim together. Um, but also at the same time, thinking about what's on the other side, right? Especially when it comes to the AAPI Heritage Month that's widely celebrated and really pushed in this country. What's your view when it comes to its meaningful representation today? And what are your views on how and where we stand right now? Can we do better? Is it enough? What else is missing? What else is lacking? What else should we do? Representation, the reality is that from, from you know, my perspective as a sociologist, representation is just one thing, right? You know, being visible is just one thing. Um, we might want as a community to also reflect on our internal hierarchies, even within the minorities, right? Within in our own communities. Filipinos, for example, we know that some Filipinos are occupy, um, occupy a much higher position than some, somebody else. Uh, and this is true among Filipino Americans or Filipinos or Filipinos who had just migrated to the U.S. Um, they're not on the same level as those who have been here for the longest time. These hierarchies creep into how we see each other, how we treat each other, how we view it, the other as a potential competitor or not, as part of our community and, and, and so forth. I think that's one way, one, one area that where we need to be very honest about, about the hierarchies within, within the community. So the, in other words, I'm asking ourselves to reflect on the, that the whole label, you know, AAPI, that label, it's not a homogeneous label. Mm -hmm. Very obviously. It's not a homogeneous label. It's not as if we're all in this together and we're all in the same plane and we're all equal here and we're all fighting for ourselves together. No. Uh, if we are just honest about it, we do have different political ideologies, religious conviction and, and things of, you know, time here in the U.S. And, and that all of that colors the way we, we look and see uh, and look at and see each other. And we just have to be honest and reflexive about this. Um, that's one. So, so representation is important, but if we're not honest about the hierarchies, the inequalities, the asymmetries, what we call power asymmetries uh, in our community, then there's only so much that the community could accomplish together. That's very true. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's very insightful because for us, even within our own home or within yes. our own neighborhood, or as AAPIs, we still have a lot to do and a lot to improve on. Um, um, but let's flip the table. If, say, for example, you're talking or observing um, the non-AAPIs, what are your thoughts around um, where they are in their acceptance journey, probably, um, or their level of openness, um, or their level of collaboration, or um, being able to treat to treat AAPIs equally. So, what are your views around that on the other side? You know what? At the end of the day, it's about being exposed to the other that makes a huge difference, and this is true in sociology. Sociologists have asserted this again and again and again. There are so many concepts that we use to talk about this: conviviality, cosmopolitanism, multiculturalism. So many, many concepts have been developed over the years in sociology and anthropology about about interacting with other people, um, in, in religion, interfaith dialogue, interreligious conversations, all those things, right? 
in my experience, so I taught in Hong Kong, I taught in Germany, did my graduate studies in Singapore and in the UK. I realized that it's the people who have traveled around who mm. really are far more open-minded. And this is my encouragement, I suppose, to, to, to many people who can, if you have the capacity to travel, please do travel. Um, and I'm speaking not just to the majority, but also to any, I mean, uh, any individual for that matter. Because I think the, the, the ability to travel and to interact with other people, that makes a huge difference. And by that, I really mean not just, you know, going somewhere to Asia and, and going to the beach and then packing your stuff up and then go back to your country. No, not that. But really interacting with locals and getting to know them, it makes a huge difference. Why? Why? Because you're putting a face, a face, a story, an entire narrative right, to, to, to the other. So the, the next time that you encounter racism towards that group, it would be impossible for you not to think of that person and his or her own story. That humanizes the other. The inability to humanize the other because simply because you do not have the exposure towards the other is what breeds a lot of this racism and hostility towards other people. These people, they're like that. They're lazy. Oh, those, those people, they're just out there to, uh, to, to, to take over our country and so on and so forth. Those are, those are stories you concoct because you don't understand where those people are coming from. And this is true, not just in the U.S., but in so many places around the world. The history of fascism tells us exactly that, uh, that lesson. And, and unfortunately, even to this day, uh, we haven't gone very far. <laughs> but at the same time, what's particularly nice about he being here in the U.S. is that we live in a truly multicultural, you know, diverse society. And it doesn't take a lot of effort to encounter other people in the office, in the workplace, in the university. I would love to, especially you know, in the in the classroom, you know, encourage students and 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 in the workplace, our colleagues to get to know other people. What are what's their story? I mean, this conversation that we're having, Joseph, something like this, you know, over coffee. What's your story? Uh, what brings you here? You know, tell me about your 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 family and where did you grow up and why? And, and, and to be honest, Joseph, this is something that I am experiencing very beautifully uh, at the university, University of Louisville. I've been hanging out with some graduate students and some of our more senior colleagues and, and I get to know them. I really have a very different sense of America now because I'm in the mm -hmm. South, you know, I'm not right where you are, Joseph, for example. Yes. <laughs> different environment. And, and I'm just glad in a way that I'm here because I am now, okay, so this, this is why they think like that politically. This is why that's what they think of other people because it's the conversations, it's the time that I am spending with, with, with not with some of them that, that's making me realize, okay, okay, now I have a better sense of, of, of America. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm appreciating the country a lot more because of that. Oh, I love that you went back to your core of education in answering that question. And I think that's the reality that we all have to embrace right now when it comes to understanding differences. It's yes. a matter of being educated and having that real authentic level of curiosity. Yes. Curiosity coming from really unpacking and understanding who and what is different amongst other people than ours mm -hmm. and not breed into this thinking of indifference, being really very purist on what black is and what white is, and really understanding and having that appreciation of accepting the differences and embracing the differences and seeing the beauty around it, which I think will really be super helpful when it comes to really understanding everyone and where everyone stands. And I think coming from someone, you as a real professional when it comes to sociology and development studies, you made it sound so simple and practical for, you know, no normal Josh most like me, for example, to make it really, you know, understandable and applicable on our everyday lives. But diving deeper now onto emerging trends or areas in your profession, in development studies, for example, or sociology, because I know it's also ever evolving. What are these areas that continuously excite you? And where do you see your research heading in the coming years as you unpack these? And how 
you can make this more accessible when it comes to the applicability of these, you know, big concepts and researches that you're doing so that it can positively influence people well, like me to bring that to life. Oh, thank you for asking this. Maybe I can talk about the book that I am working on. Sure. Uh, well, so I'm on, I'm on sabbatical, right, from my university, uh, and now University of Louisville is hosting me and giving me the time and the space to work on my book. And the book that I'm writing is about religion and politics in the Philippines. These are two topics, religion and politics, that you're not supposed to talk about with anyone, right? The moment you open your mouth to religion, you're going to make an enemy of the other person. The moment you talk about politics, it's much worse, right? And then you combine these two together, it's worldwide, <laughs> worldwide. <laughs> But for some reason, this is where I was led, religion and politics. Because at the end of the day, right, I feel that without confronting these hard questions about religion and politics, we will never really progress as a society. We will just keep spe sweeping all of these big issues under the rug and thinking that, uh, and you know, um, and, and convince ourselves that everything is all right, everything is just perfect. But in reality, it's not. And religion colors our political views. And this is true in the U.S. Research shows that. That, that political divisions are to be traced along religious convictions. Certain religious convictions and beliefs color people's understanding of the LGBTQ+, plus, of, of domestic violence, of death penalty, who deserves to die. All of that had so much religion to it, right? Um, or moral worldviews. So, so I feel that this is a conversation that I would like to keep writing about, at least as far as this book is concerned. I have been doing that for the past years, but I'm, I think this might be the culmination, this book that I am writing. And I want people, whether here in the Philippines or anywhere, and thankfully here in the past months that I've been here, I've gone around, visited different universities to talk about this pro project. And I'm seeing that there's a big interest in religion and politics outside the US. It's a big theme in the US. You know, there are so many sociologists, political scientists writing about religion and politics in the US. But thankfully, there are also so many who are interested in these topics outside the US. I feel that we can keep talking about this and writing about this just to make people feel that, to make, to convince people that, yeah, yeah. Um, I am looking at this political issue in this manner because this is my religious conviction. And then that begs the question, Joseph, what about other people who do not believe like me? How do I treat them? That, I feel, is the kind of conversation that I want my work to inspire. But what about, say, you're a Christian. What about, what about those who are not Christian? Or what about those Christians who do not subscribe to the same set of beliefs as you do? Because there are many kinds of Christians, right? There are conservative Christians, there are progressive Christians, and there are Christians right there in the middle. There are Christians who don't, who haven't thought about these things and assume that this is the only right interpretation of the Bible and so on and so forth. And as a sociologist, I'm saying, hey, domestic violence is real in the Philippines, but we don't have a divorce law. What do we do? Mm. Hey, the LGBTQ plus are suffering different forms of discrimination in the Philippines, but we don't have any law protecting the LGBTQ plus from different forms of discrimination. What do we do? The war on drugs. So many Christians thought that it was the right thing to do. Mm. Eradicate criminality in the Philippines. But, and yet, thousands of people died. Surely not all of them were guilty. And surely there, were, there are better ways of dealing with criminality than simply just getting the police to shoot them down wherever they are. And, and, and unfortunately, they were, for the most part, in urban poor households. These are questions that you cannot simply just assume to be black and white questions with black and white answers. These are questions that take a lot of courage and humility. Jail, I am so excited to read this oh. book. I'm super, super excited. And um, I think it's really what the world needs right now, not only the Philippines, not only the U.S., because I think we were able to progress in such ways where the economics, the politics, the commercialism, we've passed that stage already. I think we have to go back to the core of these 
topics that we were shushed in or not being talked about, or mm -hmm. there's no real scientific or at least um, academic background around how best to tackle them, and at least to have that conversation. I think I love how you've positioned it in such a way that you will inspire a meaningful conversation coming from various camps. It's not really pushing forward an agenda, but it's really more about finding ways for people to talk about these very important topics that really would affect our lives today and future generations. So to open our eyes, to clear our minds, and find that space to talk about these very important topics. No, I'm, I'm extremely delighted that you're. that's how you're up, up, you know, appreciating this conversation, Joseph, because at the end of the day, you're right. I mean, yeah, I mean, in a way, I have to be honest also, right? I have, I have a certain agenda, right? I mean, I've got, obviously, I've got a progressive agenda as a sociologist, and I want people to be more open-minded when it comes to these things. From a Christian perspective, I cannot change people, right? It's the Lord who changes people, right? It's the Lord who changes hearts. So I cannot really do that. At the very least, what I'm just hoping is, is, is that, people would start asking these questions. And maybe because I'm an educator, I believe that the moment you get asked a difficult question, like any student in a classroom, once he or she gets asked a question that he doesn't get to answer right there, he has one of two choices, either to go to the library to think about that or to just assume that, oh, maybe I don't need this question and maybe I'll just move on with life. And, 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 and those two different trajectories will really mark different the choices in life later on. I leave it to that person. But at the very least, we get to ask these questions uh, in our families and in our in our churches. But jail, you might be sowing seeds of discord. And I have been accused of that, Joseph. Uh, I have been accused of sowing seeds of discord. I should be, as a good Christian, I should be talking about harmony and unity and and placating whatever conflict there might be, right? We should be we should be warriors of peace and not warriors of conflict. Okay, not sure. Is that really peace when we are turning a blind eye or we're, we're simply disregarding that there are issues at stake here? Right? Is, is that peace? Whether or not you admit it, the conflicts emerge. The conflicts continue. The discriminations against the LGBTQ plus carry on. Domestic violence carries on. You may have your own peace, but the world doesn't have its peace. Is that peace? Yeah. Yeah, those are like really thought-provoking questions in our community, especially coming from our background. We were born and we, we lived in the Philippines, very third world country, you know, with the situations that we've faced that led us to where we are today, um, that we are very much aware that it's far from being perfect, but we're doing our very best in this generation um, to somehow be a part of that conversation and to make it better, hopefully, in the future, which I think at the end of the day is what really matters in terms of what we can contribute right now. Which brings me to my last question to you, Jail. Same question that I ask all my guests because it's all about going back to living a meaningful life. Let's just circle back on what you truly feel uh, when it comes to defining a meaningful life to you. What is that and how do you live that every day? Uh, this is a serious question for me, Joseph, because <laughs> um, there's something about turning 40 that makes mortality far more real for you. I, I don't know. I mean, biological changes, I'm seeing it. My gray hair is starting to... <laughs> you know, I'm... I'm, I'm I'm no longer as agile or as young as I used to be. I, I, I feel some of these things already. Uh, we only have one life to, to live, you know, at least as far as we can tell, right, from, from where we are right now. And, and every choice that we make, I feel, has to be undergirded by kindness and by a desire to make a difference to the other person. And in my context, it's my students. In my context, it's the Philippine society the public sphere uh, who might be reading my work with whom I may be agreeing or disagreeing. Um, and ultimately, at the end of the day, I just want to be that kind of person who will set an example that you can be an academic without being nasty. You can be a professor without being insecure. You can be an academic and still be pursuing things that, that matter to you and to, to, to society and 
and inspire others along the way. And finally, maybe I can, I wish to be that kind of human being who can exemplify that, that it's okay to make certain sacrifices um, in the name of the common good, in the name of something much more, much more beautiful and much bigger than who we are. Um, obviously, it's my faith you know, that, that caused me to do ex all of that. It's my faith also that empowers me to do that. But, but there's also the bit of this world, you know, that, that makes me realize, no, Jail, you can't be selfish. You can't just be thinking about yourself here. Very well said, Jail. It's like, I love how you opened your heart. My takeaways would be, you know, making a difference to others, kindness, and going beyond yourself. Yeah. Which I think you're living and breathing and I, actioning I, I, right so. now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, definitely like hearing your story is just like purely inspiring. And I think, and I hope that a lot of academics and a lot of students would also embrace that. And I personally am hoping when the right time comes, we'll also embrace it that way so that, you know, all of us will hold hands together and make a difference for that common good that we're all aspiring to actually have the positive effect for. So now, Jail, I want to open the floor for you. I'm sure that a lot of people want to reach out and ask you questions and to collaborate and have like coffee chats with you. If you're open to, you know, giving how best they can reach out to you, floor is yours. Let them know. Of course. Yes. And so many people have reached out to me after encountering some of my writing. Some of them have good things to say. So some of them have nasty <laughs> stuff. It's okay. It's okay. We're, we're, we're uh, thick-skinned enough, I think, to, to, to take all of them. Please reach out to me. I've got my social media accounts on Twitter. I've got my Facebook account, my email. Yeah. Yep, I'm happy to, to, uh, to, 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 to hear from you, um, especially if you're a, a person who wants to become an academic and you don't know where, where to begin, or maybe you're a, a person of faith. And some of the, con the things that we talked about, Joseph and I talked about, um, piqued something in you, please, please do reach out and, and I'd, be, I'd, I'd be happy to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jail. This has been an amazing conversation. Really appreciate everything uh, that you've shared, learned a lot, and is definitely very inspired. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Maraming maraming salamat sa inyo. God bless you.